Hey, welcome back. Today we're looking at Henry VI, Part 3, one of Shakespeare's books about the War of the Roses. And if you've been following along with Henry VI, Part 1 and Part 2, you've seen the progression throughout these history plays. It started in Henry VI, Part 1 with the death of heroism, where all the great old heroes were being killed and wiped out, and disunion and personal agendas were really getting in the way of the health of the nation. This idea continued in Henry VI, Part 2, where we saw the breakdown of justice and character selfishness led to violence and bloodshed. Now we see the repercussions of all that in the civil war that breaks out in Henry VI Part Three. At the very end of Part Two, we had a big battle, the Battle of St. Albin. That ended with Richard, Duke of York, winning the day and Henry and Margaret and all of their that bunch having to run away. We also saw York's sons, Edward and Richard, who were fighting in that battle. Richard the Hunchback, who managed to kill Somerset, York's old enemy. And York himself killed old Clifford. And as they were running away, young Clifford, the son of old Clifford, swore that he would cause mischief for the death of his old father. He's gonna get back that old York. And so we're still York versus Lancaster, the two families, all fighting over the crown. This play is going to be complicated and bloody. And if you had trouble following all the loyalties in the last play, this one makes it even worse. Because not only are there a whole lot of characters and each character has his or her own allegiance, but also there's a whole lot of defecting and a whole lot of switching loyalties throughout this play. And each side takes its turn as the underdog. So there's a lot of complex action to follow. Unifying this whole play, though, are a couple of big themes. Number one, the play explores the severe and painful consequences of war, specifically civil war. And we're going to see a whole lot of characters who really had no reason to be involved with this, but who are drafted in and drawn in. Over and over again, the leaders are going to conscript, 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 and draft and draw in all of these innocent people. And they're going to fight and they're going to die for a cause that really is ultimately not that important to them. And not only that, but as a civil war, it means that families are fighting each other. That's really the basis of the overall thing. The Yorks and the Lancasters are two branches of the same family who can't decide on a claim to the throne. And so they're killing each other. And there are fathers and sons who are all killing each other across these battlefields. It's a horrible tragedy and nothing good comes from it. Along with this, most of these battles and these acts of violence stem from a desire for revenge. There's certainly that seeking power, but that's been supplanted in this play by a desire for revenge. Young Clifford, who ran away in the last play after seeing his father slaughtered, not only does he want to get back at the man who killed his father, but he wants to kill York's whole family in revenge. We have the character Westmoreland, who doesn't play a vital role in the story, but he has the a, a perfect embodiment of the kind of vengeful spirit that many of the characters express. He says, Plantagenet, of thee and these thy sons, thy kinsmen and thy friends, I'll have more lives than drops of blood were in my father's veins. So for the death of my father, for every drop of blood my father shed, I will kill one of yours. And that vengeful spirit leads to ever-increasing violence and animosity. In the midst of this cascading drama of violence, we have two characters that undergo a significant transformation. The first is Henry VI himself. So he wasn't much of a king, starting all the way back in Henry VI Part I, and he's never been much of a useful king. In this play, he begins as a very weak and hollow man who no longer knows what to do and is being pushed around as he always has been. Margaret, his wife, the queen, keeps stepping up and leading the armies into battle, whereas Henry, they actually ask him to step out of the battle because he's putting a damper on the men's spirits. And yet, in this play, he undergoes a kind of transformation. Not that he gains military strength, nor that he gains any sort of prowess or strength like that, but that he gains a kind of pacifistic strength. As he watches the horrors of revenge all around him and the horrors of civil war all around him, he has a kind of vision that ultimately leads him to give up on war altogether, even what a lot of his friends might call a just war. And the spiritualism and religion that he's always been associated with becomes more of a reality and more of a strength than it seemed to be in the last few plays. Sure, he always used religious words before, but they were all just to show his weakness and his frailty. Now, there's something of a pacifistic strength to him. 
Now he gains a kind of self-awareness that he didn't have in the previous plays, to where he realizes that he cannot step into this role as military leader and hero, but rather that virtuous deeds that he has are all that he has to offer for the world. And so he hands over his rulership. There are two scenes in which he hands over rulership in this kingdom. The first is in his weakness and confusion, and the second is more in his self-awareness. Ultimately he dies, but he's a much more tragic and likable character by the end than he is at the beginning. The second transformation is in Richard, the son of the Duke of York. Richard who becomes Richard of Gloucester, who becomes Richard III. And we know Richard III as the iconic villain of Shakespeare. But his transformation into a truly evil and rotten person happens right in the middle of this book. As he comes to discover that the things that most other people seek after cannot ultimately satisfy him, he finds a need for absolute power, and comes to decide that because absolute power is the only thing that can truly bring him happiness, therefore it must be got at all costs, casting aside any of the moral codes of his day. And so, to some extent, Henry VI's tragic holiness becomes a counterpoint to Richard's tragic evil. Let's do a quick look through the play. To start with, Act One begins right as the last play ended with the victory of St. Alban, and York leads his men into the throne room and sits down on the throne and proclaims himself king. Henry comes in and argues with him about who should have kingship here, and Henry even claims that it would be just for him to use all of his power to fight against Richard. But he does come to discover that his claim to the throne is actually weaker than Richard's. His claim comes from the fact that his great-grandfather, Henry IV, forced Richard II to abdicate and forced Richard II to claim him as his heir. So even though he shouldn't have been his heir, Richard II made him heir only because he was forced to. Therefore, it was a kind of disloyalty, therefore it shouldn't count, whereas Richard's claim is a more direct lineage. Henry's confidence really crumbles when his own friends are starting to look at him and be like, you know what, he does have a claim here. Exeter switches sides right in the middle of this. Warwick's been on York's side the whole time. Of course, Clifford's on Henry's side, but only because he hates York so much. May the ground gape and swallow me alive where I shall kneel to him that slew my father. So ultimately when they corner him, he says, fine, just let me rule as king for the rest of my life, and then I will claim you as my heir, York. Clifford is not able to accept this, because that means that York, his most hated enemy, is no longer his enemy, but will become his king down the road, and he can't stand that. So he runs off to join Queen Margaret in raising an army. But Henry also realizes that in order to make peace here and resolve the conflict, he's going to have to disinherit his own son, Prince Edward. So there's a weird little time gap thing going on in Shakespeare. Try not to worry about it too much. Suddenly, Henry has a son we didn't know about before in the plays, and he's apparently old enough to be involved. I bet you anything he looks like Suffolk. The scene ends with Henry having tried his best to make peace, but now Margaret is amassing an army with her son, Prince Edward, and with Clifford, and she's gonna try to get help from everybody she knows who will back the Lancaster side. So Henry can't make a kind of peace, no matter how hard he tries. And even though York agreed to the terms, in the next scene, the, the sons of York, Richard and Edward and George, are trying to convince him to go ahead and break his oath, because after all, it wasn't a good oath in the first place. Not a whole lot of loyalty or trueness to anybody in this play. And they want what's theirs. But it seems like the oath wasn't much of anything anyway, because here comes Margaret with her huge army to fight against them. The rest of Act One is the Battle of Wakefield, which is this big battle between Queen Margaret's and all of her friends' army, and York and all of their friends' army. In the midst of this, young Clifford finds the youngest son of York, who is still just a little boy, and he slaughters him horribly. He laughs about it because now he's gotten some kind of revenge for the death of his old father. The battle goes badly for York, and at the end he is captured by his enemies. Margaret and Clifford stand around and laugh at York and his defeat, and then tell him about the death of his young boy Rutland, and give him a handkerchief covered in Rutland's blood to wipe his tears with. Brutal! And they are so pleased to get revenge on York. Finally, they kill him and set his head on top of the city of York. Act 2 begins with the sons of York trying to figure out what happened. They find out about the death of Rutland, they find out about the death of their father, Richard, Duke of York. 
They also find out from Warwick that they lost another battle at St. Alban. Now that Richard, Duke of York, is dead, that means that Edward is next in line, so they proclaim Edward King, they regroup, and they march to fight again. We jump to the Lancaster side, where Henry is speaking with Margaret and with his son, Prince Edward, and they're about ready to just really sideline him for this because he doesn't like all this fighting. Margaret convinces him to knight his son. And so Henry knights Prince Edward, saying, Edward Plantagenet, arise a knight and learn this lesson. Draw thy sword in right. He desires for a righteous kind of fighting at this point. But Edward instead says, My gracious father, by your kingly leave, I'll draw it as a parent to the crown, and in that quarrel use it to the death. So he's going to fight for the crown, not just for the right. And that's what they're all doing, is fighting for the crown. But here comes Team York with the White Roses, and they're ready to fight, and we start our next battle. And again, the language of retribution and revenge is all through the insults that they trade back and forth. They know that Clifford murdered their little brother. They know that Margaret and Clifford slew their father. And now Richard and Edward and George are ready to get revenge. At one point, Henry tries to talk everyone down and says, Have done with words, my lords, and hear me speak. And his wife says, Defy them then, or else hold thy lips. And the king says, I prithee, give no limits to my tongue, for I am king and privileged to speak. And then his own people, as well as the other side, talk over him. Clifford says, my liege, the wound that bred this meeting here cannot be cured by words, therefore be still. Their wounds against me, my wounds against them, they can't be cured by talk anymore, we have to fight this out. And so Henry just gets shouted down. As the battle goes back and forth, and there are several fighting scenes where one side seems to be ahead and then the other side seems to be ahead, Ultimately, there's this scene where Henry, who is outside of the fighting and all alone, sits there sort of in shock. And as he sits on a little hill, he watches a son who has just killed a man who drags the body up and he says, I've just killed this guy, I'm going to search him for money. And he opens up the, the helmet and he sees that it's his own father. And another person who is just dragging up a body, it's a father who sees that he's killed his own son. And the horror of that realization and the overall horror of civil war sinks into all of them, but especially to Henry, who in this moment realizes that he, as the king who cannot control his country, who lets his country sink into civil war, is really the saddest person of all, the biggest loser here. And he realizes that being a king is not something that he can do, and not something that he'll ever be able to do. And from here on out throughout the play, he's only going to advocate for peace, never for anything else. The battle ends and Clifford has been slain. He crawls over to die, and the Orcists surround his body and insult him and laugh at him for being dead. Again, very, very vengeful, and they decide to set up his head instead of their father's to tote their victory to him. So, vengeance back and forth, and now the Yorkists seem ahead again. So Henry goes out into hiding, and Margaret goes to France to try to get some support from the King of France, and thus begins Act 3. In Act 3, Henry gets captured in the very first scene by a couple of peasants who are like, oh yeah, it's the old king, capture him. And Edward, who has now proclaimed himself king and is sitting on the throne, feels really good about himself. And Warwick has gone to France to claim the French princess, Lady Bona, to be the queen for Edward. And with Edward's allegiance with France, he's going to be sitting hunky-dory. But in scene two of Act Three, Edward is petitioned by a woman named Lady Elizabeth Grey. And Lady Grey's husband died in battle, she lost all of her property, and she's petitioning the new king for help. Edward shows what kind of king he's going to be by, instead of accepting her petition, which she deserves, he sits back and he says, well, what's it to ya? And he asks her to sleep with him in exchange for her husband's property. When she refuses because of her honor, he says, well, 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 okay, how about I marry you? Because he just has to have her. Of course, that jeopardizes the whole engagement and allegiance with France that he sent Warwick to help out with, leaving Warwick in a really embarrassing place. And all of Edward's brothers are really disappointed in him. George, now George of Clarence, and Richard both are really disgusted. And in this moment we have Richard's transformation. Clarence wears his heart on his sleeve, and so um, he's able to tell Edward exactly what he thinks, but Richard keeps his cards hidden. He's 
somewhat subtly, sarcastically supports Edward, but underneath we see that something is happening to him. This whole evil soliloquy that Richard has that transforms him from the somewhat sarcastic, very vengeful, not a great person brother to the real evil man he's going to be up into Richard III is fantastic and deserves to be read. Aye, Edward will use women honorably. Would he were wasted, marrow bones and all, that from his loins no hopeful branch may spring to cross me from that golden time I look for. Then yet, between my soul's desire and me, the lustful Edward's title buried, is Clarence, Henry, and his son, young Edward, and all the unlooked-for issue of their bodies to take their rooms ere I can place myself. A cold premeditation for my purpose. Why, then, I do but dream on sovereignty, like one that stands upon a promontory and spies a far-off shore where he would tread, wishing his foot were equal with his eye, and chides the sea that sunders him from thence, saying he'll lay it dry to have his way. So do I wish the crown, being so far off, and so I chide the means that keeps me from it, and so, I say, I'll cut these causes off. Flatter me with impossibilities, my eyes too quick, my heart or weans too much, unless my hand and strength could equal them. Well, say there is no kingdom then for Richard. What other pleasure can the world afford? I'll make my heaven in a lady's lap and deck my body in gay ornaments, and which sweet ladies with my words and looks? No miserable thought, the more unlikely than to accomplish twenty golden crowns. Why, love forswore me in my mother's womb, and for I should not deal in her soft laws, she did corrupt frail nature with some bribe to shrink mine arm up like a withered shrub and make an envious mountain on my back. Where sits deformity to mock my body, to shape my legs of an unequal size, to disproportion me in every part, like to a chaos or an unlicked bear whelp that carries no impression like the dam? And am I then a man to be beloved? Oh, monstrous fall to harbor such a thought. Then such this earth affords no joy to me, but to command, to check, to overbear such as are of better person than myself. I'll make my heaven to dream upon the crown. And whilst I live to count this world but hell, until my misshaped trunk that bears this head be round impaled with a glorious crown, and yet, I know not how to get the crown, for many lives stand between me and home. And I, like one lost in a thorny wood that rents the thorns and is rent with the thorns, seeking a way and straying from the way, and not knowing how to find the open air, but toiling desperately to find it out, torment myself to catch the English crown, and from that torment I will free myself or hew my way out with a bloody axe. Why? I can smile, and murder whiles I smile, and cry content to that which grieves my heart, and wet my cheeks with artificial tears, and frame my face to all occasions. I'll drown more sailors than a mermaid shell, I'll slay more gazers than the basilisk. I'll play the orator as well as Nestor, deceive more slyly than Ulysses could, and, like a Sinon, take another Troy. I can add colors to the chameleon change shapes with Proteus for advantages, and set the murderous Machiavel to school. Can I do this? I cannot get a crown. Tut, were it farther off, I'll pluck it down. Since life has dealt me this hand of cards, it's only justice that I keep reaching for that crown, no matter how many obstacles I have to cut through to get there. Even slaughtering my own family, I deserve it because of what nature has done to me. Cut to France, where King Louis is listening to Queen Margaret and saying, Oh, yes, I pity you. I will help you. Until Warwick comes in and says, Hey, I got a marriage proposal for Lady Bonna. And then King Louis is like, mm, Yes, actually, I totally am going to back you, Warwick. I'm siding with York. And then the messenger comes in that says, Oh, bad news, by the way. King Edward decided to marry some nobody named Lady Elizabeth Grey. And everybody's angry, except for Margaret. King Louis is very insulted, Lady Bonna is very insulted, and Warwick, who's gone to all this trouble and has completely had Edward go behind his back, 
because he's all lustful, is infuriated. And Warwick has been backing the Yorkist claim this entire time for the good of England, because it's the right claim, because he has the better claim to the crown. Now Warwick says, uh-uh, I'm done. I am on Henry's side from now on for revenge against what you just did to me. Ah, vengeance. So now we have the great military leader Warwick who is going to be on Margaret's side. Does this mean that they're going to win now? Not to mention all of France's help. Uh-oh, Edward, you made a bad call. Act 4 begins with Edward getting all ready and, and getting his army together, and he hears about Warwick coming on. And Clarence says, you know what, you might be my brother, but I'm totally on their side too. This whole thing with Lady Grey was wrong. And so Clarence goes and joins Warwick's army as well. And yep, the tides turn on Edward because he gets captured by Warwick and Clarence. And Lady Grey, upset and afraid, runs away into hiding with her new baby. And then Warwick goes to free King Henry from the tower. What a turn of events! But Edward's captivity doesn't last very long because Richard comes to his rescue and springs him from captivity. Warwick rescues Henry from the tower, but he doesn't really want to be king anymore. He's realized that he cannot do this job. He cannot be military leader. He cannot be great hero. All he has is virtue. And so he hands over his government to Warwick and Clarence. He names them protectors. Notice the parallel between this scene and the first scene where he was forced to hand over his kingdom to York. In this case, he's doing it not with a struggle and not with thoughts of violence, but he's doing it with a desire for more peace. It is the only way he knows how to bring forth peace. Edward goes home to the city of York, and when he arrives, they're like, wait, 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 aren't you the enemy of the king? And he says, no, I'm still Duke of York, so you should still let me in. And then when he gets inside, Montgomery comes up and says, hey, aren't you claiming to be king? And Edward's like, "Wah." And then Montgomery says, fine, I won't help you if you're not claiming to be king. And Edward says, no, I'm claiming to be king. And so then he turns around and restates his claim and starts to fight again. Henry, having just been rescued two scenes ago, is captured because Edward's back in business. And so now we come to act five with a lot more fighting. We have this big moment with all these armies lining up, and oh look, there's all these armies siding with Warwick, and oh look, there's all these armies siding with Edward. And here comes Clarence, oh yay, Clarence is on Warwick's side. Just kidding, he's back on Edward's side, because Edward is family, man. Whose side is anybody on anymore? I don't know. The Brothers York, back in business, until Richard decides to kill you all in the next play. Warwick gets killed, but Margaret comes in with her army, he's like, oh, okay, well let's keep fighting anyway. On Somerset, on Oxford, go fight the Yorkists! Edward, Richard, and Clarence get ready to fight against Margaret. They've won against Warwick, but now they're ready to fight against Margaret and Ed Tewksbury. On the Lancaster side, Warwick's death has really shaken up the morale. But Queen Margaret, who's, you know, really tough, she says all kinds of really intense, violent things about how she's gonna beat up on all of them, and Prince Edward is like, yeah, go mom, we're tough. <laughs> The battle engages, it's intense, it's violent, the York side wins! Margaret is captured, Prince Edward is captured, and even though they say they're not going to hurt him, then all three of the brothers, the sons of York, stab Prince Edward in front of his mom. In a scene that again parallels the grief of York over the death of Rutland at the beginning of the play, we end the play with Margaret getting the same sort of treatment, watching her own child die in front of her. And it's intense, and it's horrifying. And even if, I guess, she deserved it because of the awful stuff she was doing at the beginning of the play, it's brutal. Weeping, she begs for them to kill her, and they refuse, with the exception of Richard, who's about to do it, but Edward's like, no, 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 don't do it. Richard said, why should she live to fill the world with words? But they decide instead to just pitch her off to France where her father has gone broke sending her armies. Margaret's speech over her son's body is great. Oh, Ned, sweet Ned, speak to thy mother, boy. Canst thou not speak? Oh, traitors, murderers, they that stabbed Caesar shed no blood at all, did not offend, nor were they, nor were not worthy blame, if this foul deed were by it to equal it. He was a man, this in respect a child, and men ne'er spend their fury on a child. What's worse than murderer? that I may name it. No, no, my heart will burst, and if I speak, and I will speak, that so my heart may burst. Butchers and villains, bloody cannibals, how sweet a plant you have untimely cropped. 
You have no children, butchers. If you had, the thought of them would have stirred up remorse. But if you had ever chanced to have a child, look in this youth to have him so cut off as deathman. You have rid this sweet young prince. And Richard runs off to the tower to slaughter Henry in cold blood. And so the play comes to an end with Edward finally settling down and saying, at last the kingdom has peace and here I sit in peace. And here's my new child, my son, kiss him brothers. So that way we'll all be united and be peaceful. And Richard sitting over there like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, just wait till my play. The end. Thanks for watching. You can click to subscribe or to watch another Shakespeare video. I am skipping to a comedy next and doing the comedy of errors as part of the Shakespeare 2020 read through. I will get back to Richard III eventually. And as soon as I do, I'll put a link up here as well. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.